Bible character is Joshua. I like Joshua because God made him a promise that he would inherit the promised land and he sees that promise and he saw God do great things in his generation and I think he's such an example of, of the kinds of things, the exploits that God wants to do through your life. And there are many famous miracles that Joshua was a part of in the Bible. He crosses over the Jordan River. He marches around the walls of Jericho. They made a kid song about that. All of that is phenomenal, but my favorite exploit in the life of Joshua doesn't get nearly enough airtime, if you ask me, and it's recorded, it's tucked away in Joshua chapter 10. God's people have already crossed into the promised land. They're already standing on the borderline of a breakthrough. They're going to inherit everything that God swore under oath to them and their ancestors. And Joshua finds himself in a predicament. He, he essentially made a bad alliance with some people called the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were a group of people that Joshua was supposed to defeat in his military campaign, but Joshua didn't take time to size up the situation and seek the Lord, so he ended up entering into a partnership with these people instead of destroying them. You might take that to represent in your life tonight some of the bad alliances that you're carrying into this forward conference. You know, like the, the relationships that are holding you down and maybe some of the addictions you've already developed already at this point in your young life, some of the, some of the habits that are already a part of your psyche. And, and I, I can't possibly name in a crowd this size every single bad alliance that is represented, but I do want to encourage you tonight as we talk about moving forward into what God has planned for you, that God actually takes the opportunity in the passage I'm about to read to you to turn Joshua's mistake into a miracle. And I just think that's phenomenal, that you serve a God who can turn your mistake into a miracle. He doesn't call game over when you, when you slip, when you gave your virginity away, when you happened to make that decision that set you back and now all your friends call you a slut. God doesn't see you that way. He thinks you're his daughter and he thinks you're special and he thinks you're all that and he thinks you deserve to be held high as a trophy of his grace. So that's the first point I want to make before I even read this passage is that the whole reason God was able to perform this miracle for Joshua is because he made an alliance that he shouldn't have made, but God in his grace and infinite mercy can turn your mistake into a miracle and actually move you forward using the momentum of the mistake that you made to show the world how good he is. That's wonderful. But let me share these three verses of scripture with you. And I'm kind of old-fashioned, so I want you to stand to your feet in honor of the reading of God's word tonight. You're going to love this. You're, you're so going to love this, because I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, they're cheering because they've already heard it, but in just a few minutes, I'm not going to preach long. I know you've been in the bus all day. I know you've been singing your heart out and your testimonies. And I, I know you've got things to do. You've got girls to flirt with. I know all that. But before you get to all that and before you get to bed and rest up to hear the real preachers for the rest of the week, I just want to lay down something real quick that is going to help you know what to pray as you enter into this Forward Conference 2010 experience. And if you'll pray this, if you will have the audacity to pray this prayer that I'm about to show you from the Bible, if you, will, if you will have the audacity to ask God to make the sun stand still over your life, I promise you that God has the ability to perform the impossible on your behalf. Now check this out, Joshua 10, 12 through 14. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, oh yeah, I need to give you a little context. The enemies that Joshua is fighting to defend the allies that he never should have hooked up with to begin with are about to get away because the sun's going down and time's running out. And Joshua knows that if they slip away as the sun goes down, he might not have the opportunity to defeat these enemy kings and it might set God's people back from stepping into everything that God has promised them. So he sizes up the situation and he summons his courage. And I want you to check out one of the most unorthodox prayers in the entire Bible. Here's what Joshua does. He prays this. Oh, son... 
stand still over Gibeon. That's bold. Oh, son, he looks at the sun. He he starts talking to the sun. (laughs) I'm so tired of praying dumb, weak prayers. I am ready to see some children of God start sizing up impossible situations and speaking to the sun in the authority of Jesus' name. This is, the kind of, this is the kind of experience I want you to have this weekend. I want you to have a sun stand still experience. Oh, sun stand still over Gibeon. Oh, moon over the valley of Ijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jasher, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since a day when the Lord listened to a man surely the Lord was fighting for Israel this was not a normal day and I want to announce something to you this is not a normal weekend you're entering into if you came just to get away from mom and dad for a couple of days If you came just to be around him for a few minutes so maybe you'll get his attention, God has something so much bigger planned. It is something epic and intergalactic and extraterrestrial that he has been planning to do in your life. There's never been a day like it before or since. Now, Father, interrupt our normal day, our normal routines, and cause the sun to stand still over our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Be seated, give me 17 minutes. I'll close. When I was 16 years old, I gave my life to Christ and I wish I had a really entertaining testimony. Um, Sometimes I hear people share their story of how they came to faith in Christ and compared to their story, mine is so boring. Do any of you have like a boring testimony of your relationship with God? Like what I mean by that is I had pretty good parents you know, and I was raised in a Methodist church and I just sat there and listened to the gospel and listened to the gospel and listened to the gospel and ignored the gospel and ignored the gospel and finally, God just clapped and and, and I responded and it was like a sudden revolution in my attitude but I wasn't like addicted to heroin or anything like that. Like seriously, sometimes I hear people share their testimony it makes me feel like mine isn't very real because it's like, You know, I was addicted to crack cocaine by the time I was nine years old. I was in a maximum security prison by age 11. I used to kill dogs and club baby seals at age 13. And I'm like, man, I can't compete with that. I'm not, it's not that interesting. But nevertheless, anytime God intersects your life with his grace, it's a miracle. Anytime God forgives a sinner, anytime he he cleanses your heart is is something special. So, um, Immediately after I gave my life to Christ, this older pastor in the small town where I grew up, he gave me a book called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It was written by a pastor in Brooklyn named Jim Cimbala. And I started tearing through that book as a junior in high school. And I'm sharing this story with you um, to refute the idea that you have to wait until you get older to do great things for God. And for all of you who have been using that as an excuse and you're waiting until some future stage in your life to get busy and make a difference for Jesus, check this out. I'm reading this book, I'm 16 years old, and I come across this sentence on page 23 of the book. I call it my page 23 vision because it was one sentence on one page of a book. I'm sitting at my parents' kitchen table. I just finished washing dishes after school. And I read this sentence, it says, I despaired at the thought that my life might slip by without seeing God show himself mightily on our behalf. And I read it over and over again. I was just gripped. It is hard for me to put into words how how tightly that one sentence gripped my imagination. And it was like bombs were going off inside of me. And I don't know if I could have explained it to you like this at the time, but in hindsight, I can tell you that God used that one sentence to plant a vision in my heart that one day I would start a church